Okay, we are back in Echo, and we are going to see what is going on with Mike. He finished his auditions, and they celebrated with cake, and now he's getting ready to go to the concert. As they dressed for the concert on Sunday afternoon, Frankie peppered Mike with questions. Do you think the band will wear their capes? How do they keep those tall hats on? What songs do you think they'll play? You're sure we get to sit right up front in the best seats? Frankie, said Mike, you're going to wear me out with questions, just like you do to Mrs. Potter. I can only concentrate on getting ready right now. Yes, we get to sit right up front, and remember, you can't ask me questions during. you got to use best concert manners. I know, but Mike, if you make it, you going to join? We already talked about this a dozen times. If I don't make it, no harm done, just like you said. If I do make it, I'll have to think about it. Aunt Uni would probably let you, long as you weren't gone from home too much. Mike avoided his eyes. Yeah, she'd probably let me, but we won't know anything till the middle of the week when the letter comes. Mrs. Potter came into the room carrying two white shirts, starched and ironed. It's time. The missus is waiting for you downstairs to knot your ties. Mr. Howard is already here, and Mr. Potter is bringing the car around front. You enjoy the concert, Michael. You deserve to sit and listen and enjoy something after all the practicing you've done the last month. Thank you, Mrs. Potter. When they were all heading down the front walk to the car, Aunt Uni put her hand on her head. I forgot my hat. I'll get it, Mike offered. Thank you. It's in the library on my desk. The felt cloche, but be careful of the hat pin. Mike ran back. On Aunt Uni's desk, he found the bell-shaped hat with the pearl-tipped pin woven through the crown. He carefully picked it up from the top of a stack of papers. Beneath it was a letter from Mr. Golding's office. Mike couldn't help but see the words stamped across the top in large red letters. Appeal granted. He read the first sentence. Your appeal for the reversal of the adoptions of Michael Flannery and Franklin Flannery has been granted and will become final upon receipt and filing of the required notarized signature below on or before the 15th of September, 1935. She was unadopting them? Mike felt like he'd been kicked in the stomach. She'd lied to him? He held on to the desk, his body shaking. How could he not have seen it? Didn't they have an agreement? Hadn't she said that everything was resolved? What about the lessons at the piano, the cake, the kind words? What about Frankie? She acted like she cared about him and was beginning to love him. How could he have been so wrong about her? What a fool he had been. It had all been a swindle, a three-month swindle so her lawyers could have more time. She never intended to keep either of them. The car horn beeped. Mrs. Potter stepped into the library. Michael, you best hurry. They're waiting. Are you feeling well? You don't have a speck of color. Without answering, he grabbed the cloche and hurried from the room. As he ran down the driveway, his heart pounded. He was so dumbfounded that he just climbed into the back seat of the car and handed her the hat, as if nothing was wrong. He'd been careful of the hat pin, but he still felt a stabbing pain in his chest. The car cruised down Amaryllis Drive. When they passed the park, Mike stared at the bench where Mr. Howard had asked him to hope for the best where he said that everything would be good and true in the end and that he didn't think it would ever come to this. But it had come to this. He stared out the window and felt lightheaded. Mike, you're awfully quiet, said Mr. Howard. Had he known too? Just tired, Mike said, keeping his face turned away and trying to make sense of it all. If he had made the band, he couldn't join because Frankie would have no place to go except the state home. If he didn't make the band... They'd be sent back to bishops, but Mike couldn't let that happen either, for the same reason. What could he do? At first, the solution that popped into his mind seemed preposterous, but as they walked into the theater at City Hall and were seated up front with the 20 finalists and their families, the idea took hold. The doors opened in the back of the theater. The Philadelphia Harmonica Band marched down the center aisle, two by two with elegant precision. Everything about the band was majestic. Their blue cadet-like uniforms with the shiny buttons, the hats, the shoes polished to a gleam, 
The band members strode past the audience toward the stage, arms swinging and harmonicas flashing in their left hands. When the regiment reached the front of the theater, the lines split. One line veered right, the other left. The musicians climbed the stairs of the stage from both sides and filled the risers. Mr. Albert N. Hoxie came onto the stage. The applause was thunderous, and the band hadn't yet played a note. He raised his baton, their spectacular sound like an entire orchestra with every kind of instrument, filled the theater with a rousing march, the one that John Philip Sousa wrote especially for them. They were as stunning and talented as everyone had said. Mike listened with a mix of regret and determination, knowing he'd never have the chance to join them. As the music swelled, so did his new plan. In the middle of the night, Mike dressed and packed his and Frankie's clothes in a small suitcase. He gathered a few books, the metal box he'd brought from Bishop's, and our harmonicas. He slipped his into his chest pocket. He looked at Frankie, sleeping peacefully across the room. Mike hated to take him from a place where he was so happy, but what choice did he have? He waited until 4.30 in the morning so Frankie could get some rest. It would be a long day, and he didn't know when or where they'd be sleeping next. He gently shook his shoulder, whispering, Wake up. Without opening his eyes, Frankie mumbled, I'm tired. Mike gently pulled him into a sitting position. I know it's early, Frankie, but you got to get dressed. We have to leave. Heavy-lidded, Frankie looked up at Mike. Leave? Where? When are we coming back? We're not coming back. We have to leave for good. Frankie rubbed his eyes and sat straighter. Why, I like it here. I don't want to leave. Shh, I like it here too, whispered Mike. But it's no matter. Listen to me. Last night before the concert, I found some papers on Aunt Uni's desk. She's sending us back to Bishop's. Frankie shook his head. No, she wouldn't. Mike put his arms around his brother. I'm not lying to you. But she likes us now, Frankie whimpered. I can tell Mike. She likes us real well, Mike hugged Frankie. I thought so too, but she must not want any kids because the lawyer's paper says she's reversing our adoption. I don't want to go back to Bishop's. Don't worry, we are not going there because we're not supposed to be separated, remember? We're getting out of here before she can send us back. He pulled Frankie's nightshirt up and over his head and handed him some clothes. Come on now, get dressed. Frankie threw his arms around Mike's neck. What about Mr. and Mrs. Potter and Mr. Howard? He was crying now. Mike rocked him, choking back his own tears. I, I wrote a note telling them we were leaving and how it was the best summer of our lives. They'll have to understand. Maybe someday we can come back and visit, but right now we gotta go. You and me, we stick together, remember? Frankie nodded into Mike's neck. Sniffling, he slid from the bed and began to dress. Where, where are we going? On a train. You always wanted to go on a train, right? Frankie nodded, his eyes wide and watery. To where? New York City. Frankie hiccuped and his voice shook. Are we going to Carnegie Hall and to eat roasted beef and ice cream? Maybe, said Mike. He walked to the window at the side of their room. We can't risk going downstairs. Too much noise unlatching and closing the doors. He pointed to the elm outside next to the window. Think I could climb down? Frankie nodded. It's an easy one. Mike opened the window and studied the route down, his stomach squirming. He tossed their bag to the grass, then pulled back inside and nodded for Frankie to come. Reluctantly, Frankie came forward. He slid onto the sill, straddled it, and looked into the bedroom. I liked our room. He reached up to hold on to an overhanging limb and climbed out. It's sturdy. Watch how I go down. Frankie took a big step out onto another branch and sat on it, scooting on his bottom toward the main trunk where he stood and began climbing down limb by limb. Mike forced himself to watch. At the lowest branch, Frankie wrapped his body around it, flipped to the underside, dangled his legs, and dropped to the grass. Mike turned to look back one last time and whispered, I liked our room too, kid. He put a leg over the sill and grabbed the limb above him. Then he stepped out on the one below, just as Frankie had done, lowering himself to a sitting position and scooting slowly across. 
When he reached the trunk, he hugged it tight, eyes closed. Frankie whispered, Don't look at the ground. It'll make you dizzy. Just reach your leg to the next limb. Mike took a deep breath and opened his eyes, staring at the tree bark. His heart pounded. He stretched one leg until he felt the limb below. He inched his arms down the trunk, reaching with his other leg. A breeze stirred the leaves. His leg flailed, and he couldn't find the limb. Without thinking, Mike looked down. He was much higher up than he'd thought. Dizzy, he tipped sideways, grabbing a nearby branch. The harmonica slid from his pocket and landed in the fork of a smaller branch. He thought he could reach it, so he righted himself and leaned out, stretching his fingers until he grabbed it. But he wobbled and fell. In the seconds before his body and the earth collided, the wind blew a cord through the harmonica clutched in his hand. The ground slapped the air from him. Lying on his back, turning the interminable moment of breathlessness, he stared into the night. He could not rise or talk. He could only wait and hoped to inhale again. Above him, the dark, gnarled branches of the elm reached toward the heavens like a witch's crooked fingers. And yet, even in this strange limbo, Mike saw stars above him, tiny dots of light bobbing in and out from behind the fluttering leaves. His chest tightened. Frankie appeared above him, wild-eyed and calling his name, but Frankie's voice faded behind the sound of someone playing Brahms lullaby on a cello, and then that faded too, until all Mike could hear was birdsong, a brook trickling over smooth stones, and a yodel of the wind through hollow logs. Okay, watch. All right, that is the end of that section. So just like the first section, they leave us right at a cliffhanger where we don't know what's going to happen. So in your pages, your last question to answer for this section is why did Mike's mood change before the performance? So what did he see that made his mood change? And in the comments below, I want you to tell me what you think we're going to find out about Mike at the end. Like, how do you think this story ends, ends up? Do they wind up running away? Do they not? You're going to have, you finish it for me in the comments below. What do you think is going to happen um, with Mike? Okay, I hope you enjoyed that and we'll start the next story tomorrow.